If you're working for like major manufacturer or, you know, a tech company and you can, you know, go around the country to these meetings, you know, jet set, spend three days a week on conference calls or whatever, then you can play. Okay. Most people that are in small business don't have that luxury. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 165, part two. Are there questions that we should be asking? If you ask today's guest, he would say hundreds. Patrick Egan is the editor of the American Desk at the SUAS News and host and executive producer of the SUAS News podcast series, Drone TV, and the Small Unmanned Systems Business Exposition. Patrick's experience in the field spans military and civilian UAS applications. He was the director of special programs for the Remote Control Aerial Photography Association, and he is considered a subject matter expert on the UAS industry. This is part two of a two-part interview with Patrick. In this episode of the Drone Radio Show, Patrick continues to raise questions about the drone industry. Now, before we hear from Patrick, I want to thank those of you who have been supporting my funding campaign on Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. Now let's finish up our interview with Patrick Egan of SUAS News. Patrick, in our email prep before this call, you mentioned something about a NASA IG report. What are you referring to? The IG's report, and it talked about the dollar amount that they already spent, $47.6 million this year. And I want to say this year, through this year, whatever, in the next year, when they're supposed to make the recommendation, it's going to be another $40 million. Dollars. So a total of $87.6 million. Now, I'm not really as close to the work as I probably should be. I don't really get invited. I kind of get dodged. You know, I usually have to write white papers to go. White papers do talk about solutions. Usually they're science-based. <laughs> but nobody really wants to hear that. I see an effort where it's, you know, we want to get more people in there and more people in there. But most of the people that are in on the effort uh, have no idea what they're talking about. And these things get more convoluted. You know, mainly my main problem with it is, is going back to the lack of FAA participation in the beginning. If you look in there, it talks about it. There was a UAS and the NAS initiative that NASA put out. And they had a phone call and they were going to talk about all this money they had. And there's other money being spent on other things. But anyway, they were going to talk about the money. And, you know, I got invited to be on the call. And I believe I was the only civilian on that call. So, you know, we're talking telephone numbers and what we're going to do with the budgets and yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, hey, you know, sounds like there's not really a concrete plan here. What I'm hearing is starting to, you know, I'm hearing echoes of Access 5. And the grousing started. Oh, uh, what do you mean? You know, why is he even talking? He's not supposed to talk. Say, if you don't have a plan and you don't peel off some millions for the smalls and do some like kinetic energy testing and whatever else, I don't believe you're going to uh, reach all of your goals with the budgets that you're talking about. And then uh, they tried to shut me up and say, he's got to be quiet. And I said, uh, no, I'm not going to be quiet. Is this call being recorded for later, uh, you know, as a record? And they said, yeah. And I said, good, because I'm going to go on record right now. And I'm going to say, as the de facto trustee for the taxpayer, if there's not a comprehensive plan, we stand a chance of wasting the taxpayer's money like we did with Access 5. Now, you can go and you can do a Google search for Access 5. Good luck trying to find anything on that one. But that was a plan that they came up with in NASA back in 2005 and 6. I know drones are new and, you know, uh, getting drones into the NAS and UTMs and all the rest of that supposedly all new, but it's not. 
what happened there was is NASA peeled off $110 million. I think it was talking about getting the drones into Class A airspace, which is, you know, high altitude airspace or whatever. But the idea was we're going to get, you know, we're going to talk about introducing the drones into the airspace. I think it took about a year and a half and the money was gone. And they came back and they said, well, yeah, we need more money to, f to finish the program. And if you look at it, there were a few companies like Aurora Flying Sciences, Aerovironment, uh, General Atomics. I want to say Northrop Grumman was in there. I'm not sure exactly who the five total companies were off the top of my head. But the bottom line is $110 million, poof, gone, nothing. And if you search for it, there's about two paragraphs. I think there's a thank you very much from Jeff Bauer, who was flying the big iron down there at the Dryden facility. So, you know, again, it goes back. Yes, uh, I am cranky, but, uh, you know, we're talking about decades of time and hundreds of millions of dollars with nothing to show. Yeah, well, that wouldn't be the first time that a special interest tried to gain influence in a government program. Yes, well, that was another thing in the NASA IG report that kind of, you know, chapped my hide was the mention of package delivery like Google and Amazon want to do, which... You know, when they had the NASA UTM thing at NASA Ames in 2015, and I think it was Google trotted out their airspace plan with, you know, 200 feet and below is for everyone else, or 200 to 400 feet. And I said, this whole deal here smacks of the uh, bandwidth auctions. And what I'm seeing here is, is, you know, we, we want the airspace. Basically, maybe you'll lease it from us. And everybody, oh, God, you can guys wearing the tinfoil hat, and he's crazy, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, well, go uh, go read the, the report from Task Group 3 of the DAC. It mentions that right there, that exact model. You know, you got to fast forward three years, whatever. But the other thing that I don't like is I, I was calling it, too. I said, what I'm seeing here for this last mile package delivery to work at a dollar for the last mile is the taxpayer is going to have to pay for the infrastructure for the UTM. It's the only way that's going to work for that $1 last mile delivery. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, he's got the tinfoil hat on. He's a conspiracy theorist. Uh, that's never going to happen. But, you know, oh, okay, so, you know, NASA's just uh, spending $90 million out of the goodness of its heart and mentioning Google and Amazon want to deliver packages. You know, for two seconds, do you think mom and pop is going to compete with Google and Amazon delivering packages? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Can you compete with Google and, you know, in the website world, you know, and, and make a living off of that? No. So it's going to be the same deal there. This is basically corporate welfare for billionaires and their lobbyists are being paid a lot of money to make this happen. So, you know. Uh, and then when people, oh, you know, we don't have any advocacy for the small business guy, you know, that's and, and that's my whole angle on this deal. I don't care what anybody tells you. My angle has always been small business, jobs, STEM education, the hobbyist, keeping it open and, and free as possible for as many people as possible. That's my angle. I'm not selling any airplanes. I'm not selling any subscriptions to a, a cell phone app. I'm not trying to, you know, get some VC money to lock some other people out. That's not my bag. I'm not a carpet bagger. When I call people out on it, you're getting called out because you're doing something shady. You know, you don't like it, don't do it. That's all I got to say. So other than yourself, who's raising these questions? Who else is advocating for the small UAS operator? Is there anyone that has the clout to make those arguments heard? No, no. What's going on is marginalization. And again, it's not the first time that this has happened because in 2011, we had a situation where the guy that was heading up the drone thing told people, and I heard from, from several people that were told this, you do anything with Egan, we're not doing anything with you. And now that, you know, I mean, that sounds like a democratic and inclusive type of, uh, you know, process to me. Whatever, you know, they can say whatever they want to say because they haven't been able to shut me up yet. But... Basically, anyone who is not in the mold, and I'm gonna, the only other guy I'm going to use as an example or situation is the Taylor case. You remember the Taylor case, right? Mr. Taylor went out there and basically uh, went to the, uh, the, the district court, and uh, the FAA threw something together here, all slipshod, and, and uh, shot it down. Now, 
Who supported Taylor? Did AMA support Taylor? Did AUVSI support Taylor? Did anyone support Taylor? No. Taylor got marginalized and Taylor had to kind of do it on his own. There were a few other people that did help him because they thought that, that it was wrong, especially, you know, you looked at the underage people, their data got leaked on the internet with the, so not so much as a, we're sorry, FAA. I mean, the whole thing was a catastrophe. And then he went back and got it reinstated, which is funny because remember how registration was supposed to fix all of the rogue flyer problem? Again, no data some ginned up report from MITRE, but, uh, oh, yeah, we'll just slam this through. Didn't work. You know, got it reinstated. That didn't work. But anyway, the, the upshot on that is really people need to look at who is supporting what. A lot of them don't want to. They want to go to the business drone show and they want to, you know, click cocktail glasses with so-and-so and play a little cornhole or whatever games they want to play. Uh, but really, these people are selling them out. You know, it's the same deal that uh, DHS hearing on uh, potential drone threats. You know, commercial drone alliance. They're calling for the repeal of 336. You know, look who signed on to that. You know, it's it's a who's who in the professional drone world. Not really. It's all the manned interest. So, you know, it's commercial drone alliance trying to scapegoat the hobby person. You know, and, and I'm going to say, uh, you know, by and large, the people that are in the AMA are safe. It's not the hobby flyer. It's the best buy drone flyer. That's the person that's, uh, you know, unsafe. You know, uh, people talk about, again, you know, I don't have any solutions. Oh, I got solutions. You know, anything that uh, with more than a few propellers on it coming in from China or I don't want to do single China out, but from overseas should be classified and taxed as an aircraft instead of a toy. Point of sale registration, the person that buys it signs an affidavit that they understand that there are FARs. The FAA has jurisdiction over the NAS, got to be educated, blah, blah, blah. You, you could nip a lot of this right in the butt. But when you go back and you see who's lobbying for what, remember the, the registration that was going to fix everything. You had uh, Walmart and Best Buy on there, and they were pretty much like, well, you know, if it's not point of sale registration, you do whatever you want to do. The other thing I'm going to say on there is you got to go and you got to see who your buddies were on the registration task force. AMA tried to throw in a dissenting opinion, and those, uh, well, family show, the other participants on the uh, registration task force did not back them up. So I'm going to make a prediction, and it's not really a prediction because I've been hearing it from several circles that uh, come September, RC hobbyist, the AMA type member person, hobby person, is in trouble. And that's going to be probably at the hands of, of their other buddies saying that the, the rogue flyers are the whole reason there's no money in the commercial drone industry. Or not no money, but how come it's not flourishing? Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that we classify operators into two groups, the commercial operators and then everybody else under hobbyists? Like you mentioned earlier, there seems to be a third group of operators, not commercial, and really not following the hobbyist rules, but the Best Buy operators, I think you call them. Hobbyists know the rules, but they're getting blamed for what these other operators are doing. Exactly. And it's not plausible. To not know there's rules for the NAS and drones, you would have to be living in a one-room cabin somewhere in the middle of Montana. You wouldn't own a cell phone. You wouldn't read any technology blogs. You wouldn't read any newspapers. You wouldn't watch TV. You wouldn't listen to the radio. No internet access, which we know none of that is true because, you know, how are you going to do updates and stuff on your drone? You know, how are you going to fly your drone? It's not plausible. You want to know what the bottom line is? You want to know what the real problem is here? You want to fix stuff? FAA enforcement. Force your rules. Now, we're hearing a lot of people say, well, you know, <laughs> nobody ever thought the FAA was going to enforce the rules. Hogwash. That is the biggest load of family show stuff I've heard in a long time. When I was on the ARC, 2008, laid it right out. Enforcement is the third leg of the chair. You can do whatever you want. You can have all the rules you want. You can... 
however draconian you want to make them, you do whatever you want to do. If you can't enforce it, people will not pay attention to you. And these are off airport operations. The off airport operation means I pull up, stop, pull the drone out of my trunk, fly it around for 10 minutes, throw it back in the trunk and I'm out of here. It's done. How are you going to enforce that? They sat around, scratched their heads, blank stares. We talked about ID and, and, and everything else. You know, I, I used the cracker barrel and there were pictures floating around. And I even wrote it had a spruce stick. It was a slow stick, you know, uh, 10 millimeters high, one centimeter. Said, N number here with a question mark. And, you know, they were like, uh, woo, wow. We didn't really think this through. The other thing is, is if you look at the FARs, you know, try and read uh, the end number on the boom of a helicopter flying over you at 200 feet. It's almost impossible. Or a plane or, you know, certain aircraft can have end numbers that are two inches high or three inches high. You're not reading those. This is, this is a joke. All of it is kind of a joke. And I'm not going to say that there's no risk there. But, you know, the idea that we're going to have a cell phone SIM chip in our, you know, a hobby model aircraft at Johnny's 13 and he's going to have to pay 25 bucks a month for a SIM chip. You know, that's crazy talk. FAA has to have an enforcement program. I don't want to hear they don't have the money for it because they just got the budgets for their office. And I'm, I've been FOIA requesting that. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, Mr. Lawrence is supposed to write a budget every year and give it to the Associate Administrator of Aviation Safety, along with the progress report of all the work he's completed for the year. I uh, just trying to FOIA request that those don't exist, even though it mentions them in the job description. But anyway, we'll still work on that one. I don't want to hear you don't have the people to enforce the rules. Because my thing is, is why do you even have rules if you don't have anyone or any idea or an enforcement plan? Maybe the rules need to be a little bit lighter. Or maybe, you know, the enforcement needs to be a little bit more draconian. The other two things uh, rooted to these problems are where the FAA, you know, I, I call the registration task force was the shot in the foot that was heard around the world because we've noticed that other countries have followed suit. Okay. You know, you got down to 250 grams. So, you know, let's, let's, you know, back it up one second, take a big picture view. Okay. Well, we don't have the personnel or the resources to really enforce these rules, I got an idea. Let's bring it down to the toys. Let's bring it down to 250 grams. Well, do we know it's really a risk? No. Yeah, We assume it's a risk because 250-gram uh, projectiles from uh, shrapnel from explosions is dangerous. So, you know, then everything's got to be dangerous. Kind of reminds me of the uh, Monty Python. If it, you know, if she floats and it's a duck and, you know, it's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Totally ridiculous, but what they did is they shot themselves in the foot because now their purview is toys. You now administer or regulate toys at the kiosk at the mall. Does that sound like that makes any sense to you? It's just like, you know, what, nobody thought about this? You know, hey, wait a second here. I mean, I don't know, it seems a little, you know, like a common sense thing to me. Then we got the other one, the other big one here. As I said, back in the old days, it used to be three miles from an airport, okay? And back on the Ark, wasn't any idea to five miles from an airport. So back on the Ark, you know, they had Miter draw up a map, and I had them do Sacramento here, and we looked at what it would be if you had to operate five miles from an airport. So you have a three-mile ring around an airport. That's a lot of real estate, lots of airports and towns. Then you go and you extend that ring another two miles, you're really eating up a lot of territory. So instead of, let's say, having to administer an area, this airport facility, and it's the three miles around the airport, now you've almost doubled the territory that you've got to worry about and administer, and then we're going to have to build this Lance thing. You know, The Lance thing, I don't even know why that's needed. I think that it's one of these things where people want to look like they're doing something, Looks like a sweetheart deal to me. If I had more time, I'd dig deeper in that one. But, you know, why not read the airport facility maps like the FAA tells you to do when you get a COA? You know, we could uh, do away with all of that. Or we could even use flight services, 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM, which is mentioned on the test. And you can go there and we're one click box away from filing a flight plan anywhere in the world. Why are we reinventing the wheel of suffering? So, you know, we got that. We got the UTM thing. We've got all these other projects. 
And I don't think that we've really thought about what we wanted to regulate and what we wanted to control. So again, you had the three miles, now we're going to five miles. You don't have any people to administer any of this. You really don't have any money because I guess 19 million a year or whatever is not enough bread, whatever. None of it's adding up. So do you have any solutions? I just wrote an article not too long ago called The Shakedown. There's a whole solution section in there. Talks about a drone czar, somebody that actually knows the history of this process, who's been here for the last 10, 15 years, knows what's been tried, knows what's legal. The other thing, standards groups, five to 10 people on a standards group. They've got one task. They've been vetted by their peers to be knowledgeable, be actual SMEs, subject matter experts, know what they're talking about, either engineers or medical doctors or scientists, know what they're talking about, know the subject matter. Six months to one calendar year to, to come up with a standard on something. These standards have been dragging on. You know, it goes back to the, the NASA thing. Look at RTCA. RTCA just got fired from the DAC, from the Department of Transportation. RTCA was working on standards for drones for over a decade. Nothing. ASTM, since 2005, I was there. I'm getting to the point, Randy, where I've been at most of this stuff longer than anyone over there at the FAA, longer than anyone in the effort. And uh, those are the types of things that need to be implemented if we really want to move the ball forward, if we really want to get to the front of the line with the technology again. I mean, even the advocacy group thing, right? Okay, so you would think we would have, you know, the world's largest advocacy group is here. They didn't even advocate for their military members. They should have been advocating for reform of the ITAR laws. These people couldn't even sell 15-year-old technology overseas, and the Chinese are selling UCAVs to anybody who's got cash. It's just, it's mind boggling. And the other thing with that is, you know, a lot of people, I think, underestimated the Chinese. I know they underestimated the Chinese. You know, my tenure in this thing, in 2009, I was at NASA and I talked about the $1,000 Chinese UAV. I had NASA, NOAA, DOJ, DOD, FAA, um, you know, a lot of different federal groups laughed. <laughs> Tried to laugh me out of the room. It will never happen. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. You know, here we are, a thousand dollar Chinese UAV and even cheaper, like I said, would probably happen. Same deal with the Chinese developing their own UAVs or UAS and making stuff, building stuff that's very sophisticated. They would told me it would never happen. Well, you know, who was right and who was wrong. Not that I want to say that I was right all the time. I just think that they were uh really dismissed right out of hand, and, and it was foolish. Going back to the lack of standards, my experience has been that if it's a simple solution, it would have already been done by now. And since it's been so many years, and it still hasn't been figured out, obviously it's not a simple solution. Is it just too big to solve? You have to start thinking about it like this, too, okay? So think of yourself as a small business guy. Okay. And, and some of us from our Kappa went to the first meeting in uh, Reno 2005, May 2005. You know, they were talking about working on standards till 2009. And at the time, I remember saying, I can't work on this for four years. I got a business to run. So, you know, if you're working for like a major manufacturer or, you know, a tech company and you can, you know, go around the country to these meetings, uh, you know, jet set spend three days a week on conference calls or whatever, then you can play, okay? Most people that are in small business don't have that luxury. So what we have to do is we have to be serious about what we want to do. The other thing is that the FAA vacillates between the different standards groups. So, you know, somebody over at ASTM pissed the FAA off. What do you mean we only have one vote? You know, that's no good. We're going to RTCA. We're going to have our hand on the tiller, and this is the, the blessed uh, standards group. And that went on for 10 years, and we never really got anything. And I mean, I could tell you stories about that. That would chap your hide, thinking family-friendly again. But anyway, uh, and then ASTM. So what happens also is you have, you have like uh, people running the show. Now, back in the day, the people that were really running the standards and then also you know working the uh, rules here were the DOD folks, okay? 
DOD folks, at least, you know, we knew that they were pretty blatant that they were just trying to corner the market for their products, you know. What were they doing? They were trying to leverage their military programs and, the, and what they'd spent over there to kind of craft the rules over here for the commercial side of it. On one hand, you could say, okay, well, it was kind of blatant. On the other hand, you know, they're supporting the warfighter. You know, that's kind of cool over there. I, I can get that part of it. And I do want to support the warfighter and everything else. But that group had their own, let's say, agenda. Then what happened is things started to progress. You had uh, different people come on board. And for a while, you had, you know, all the drone companies came on. You had your parrots, your 3D robotics, your DJIs, other companies and people talking to Congress. Drones were new and sexy. Uh, people were going there. They're testifying. They're talking to people. Everybody wanted to talk drones, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think the cracks in the program started to show there. Other tech companies and people with money started to come into this thing and start throwing money around. And what you have now goes back to Google and Amazon and other companies looking for people to build the infrastructure for them. You also have a certain manufacturer that's been driving the bus on the regulation, crafting regulations and standards here for the U.S. NAS, which I'm not uh, happy about. Maybe you saw the WAPO articles about the uh, public-private rulemaking process they were running over there at the RTCA. Um, I think that's why RTCA got fired from the DAC. I don't think you really have to that far of a stretch. You don't have to be the house dick to figure that one out. But uh, they were playing games. And uh, certain people at the FAA were letting these people drive the bus. And I don't think that all of the fallout has reached the community yet on that one. Moving forward, Patrick, obviously there are paths that have already been committed to that all of us have to work with. What's your advice for the groups that you advocate for? Let's say have your eyes a little bit more wide open really kind of know who your friends are, um, who you patronize, who you support, because a lot of these folks are not really your friends if you really do a little digging. Again, you know, if you you can operate within the visual line of sight option, I would say, you know, try and make a niche there and work it, work it hard, head down uh, and go for it. Uh, most small business people and educators and things like that, you're not going to be able to devote the time necessary or the money to lobby on your behalf. You know, so you're pretty much going to have to roll with the punches. But I think you're going to see the true colors and the house of cards start shaking here. You're going to you're going to see that the people that supposedly were advocating for you were doing a pretty poor job. So, you know, you're just going to have to work within the rules that are there. That's it for part two of episode 165 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Patrick Egan of SUAS News. I want to thank Patrick for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about SUAS News or want to connect with Patrick, check out the webpage at suasnews.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.